Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to Traders Workshop. I'm your host, Tom Schneider, CMT with Ninja Trader. Traders Workshop, where we like to bring on the Ninja Trader ecosystem partners, help you learn more about what can you add to your tool set to become better traders. Before we get into the, the good stuff and we bring on our next guest, I do want to remind everybody that futures and options trading contain substantial risk is not for every trader. You could potentially lose all or even more than all of your initial investment. That's why we recommend you use risk capital. What is risk capital? Money you can afford to lose. It doesn't keep you up at night. doesn't extend your retirement horizon. I also want to remind everybody that past performance is not indicative of future results. And what we talk about here on the show contains neither trade recommendations nor financial advice, but should be taken for educational purposes only. With that out of the way, it is my pleasure to welcome back on to Traders Workshop the founder of Go No Go Charts, Alex Cole. How you doing, Alex? Tom, how are you? I'm uh, I'm well, thanks. Great, and uh, you know it's been a couple of months uh, since you've been on. I know um, last time we talked, we were uh, feverishly awaiting the arrival of your indicators into Ninja Trader platform. So I think we'll have some good news on that front. But um, you know for. For those of uh, of you who haven't seen Alex before, you know, Alex, if you could just explain a little bit of your background, how you got into the trading environment, yeah. and what led you to go no go charts. Absolutely. Well, my background, you'll know, but uh, for everybody on the call, we we were together for a while at Bloomberg. Um, we were just commenting how long ago that was now, and we've got kids in college and driving and all the rest of it, which seems crazy. But yeah, I started at Bloomberg. Um, early 2000s and um, just sort of fell in love with technical analysis and fairly quickly uh, that's where I specialized and that's obviously where you and I did a lot of our work both in product and in um, um, client uh, you know helping clients understand the technical analysis that we were able to provide and now we're moving on to uh, the same field in other in other places and so what really led me to the creation of go to go charts was just the the complexity of our field and and what we found have found over the last sort of 15 years or so is that there's so much good information out there that we really want to absorb and we want to aid us in our decision making but we end up uh, suffering from analysis paralysis or just that sort of you know typical chart where we've got more lines than we know what to do with and then we can't see price anymore and we can't look at important levels and and all of the real basics that are so valuable become harder to do if you overwhelm your chart with indicator after indicator so that was sort of the problem that i was facing um you know both i guess in in consulting with private clients but also in the corporate space and working with institutional investors even even those with a really sound process were complaining of the difficulty of then explaining their process maybe to the buy side if they're sell side research you know, wherever you're in technical analysis we were seeing the same problem either from the uh, the side of being new to it not being able to understand what's happening or from the side where you were really uh, you know well entrenched in your career as a technical analyst but having difficulty explaining what you're seeing or what you're doing either to yourself or to to others and that's that's where we were and so go no go charts was an attempt to uh, take the information that over the course of that sort of 15 years we'd found most valuable and put it into the chart, but do it behind the scenes so that we then end up with a chart that's color coded based on trend, but not complicated with with too much else on there. So uh, that's a long way to answer <laughs> a short question, but hopefully that makes sense. Right, and uh, you did bring in Tyler Wood, who uh, did work at the CMT. I, you know, we worked together, all three of us, uh, on various uh, partnerships, if you will, with the CMT and and Bloomberg when we were working there. And you know, Tyler's a great addition. So happy to see that you two are are continuing that collaboration. Um, I think you're, you know, I think you're skipping over something that's really cool, though. You know, the whole tennis aspect of things, right? So. Uh, yeah. For those of you who don't know, Alex, you had more than just a passing uh, interest in tennis, right? Yeah, yeah, I was a, I was a, you know, I was in that world of competitive junior sports. I was a, 
a very competitive junior, traveled the world playing for um, for my country back home for Wales and, and British squads and things like that. And then ended up uh, in America playing tennis in college and, um, you know, some semi-professional uh, attempts before injuries and other things curtailed my career. But, um, you know, now I do a bit of tennis teaching on the side and I've got a 13-year-old daughter who, uh, for better or for worse, I, I don't know if I, I, I've always wondered, should I advise her against that life? It's a pretty crazy environment of, uh, you know, a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. Of you know, Tennis is an interesting game because it's, it's you know, non non-physical right non non-contact but very uh, very alone so there's there's no help out there and we you know you go to these tournaments and you watch 11 12 year olds go through this emotional roller coaster and there's no coaching there's there's no uh, nothing allowed at all so you you know you really have to face your demons out there as a little you know little junior trying to trying to come to terms with uh, fighting against somebody else um so i, I don't know I, I always wonder maybe i should I've advised against it, but at the same time, I look back and I have lots of good memories, and I think she's doing the same thing. So she's pretty into it at the moment. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, you know, my my advice having kids as well, put you know, push them until they can't, right? Push them, don't yeah. break them, push them. Yeah. Um, my my great uncle said, now not from a competitive standpoint like you were, he said tennis is a great sport; you can play it all your life. You know, he yep. was playing tennis well into his seventies, maybe even his eighties. Yeah. Well, right? interesting, interesting. Uh, I just <laughs> so my grandmother, she was the number four ranked tennis player in the world for over eighties. <laughs> a couple, oh. a couple wow. of years. Ago. Yeah, and she traveled <laughs> with the British team to play the European Championship. She's got her British uh, warm up suit and everything. And and so I just uh, I just texted her, my old college roommate, and I said, "Hey, how old are you? You know." Let's do the 45s. Let's try to get a national ranking. <laughs> some doubles. So uh, we'll, see. we'll see. Well, but there's yeah, something for everything. That just that's what it tells me, right? There's something for everybody. Yeah, um, but so so let's go back. So when we talked together, uh, when we worked together, and we were talking about um, technical analysis, and you know, what, part of our job was to spread the word. It was to uh, help the clients and. And not just the clients externally, but internally, of course, uh, yeah. with people who would also need to use technical analysis uh, in their analysis or, you know, on the news side, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I think real quickly, you found that analysis by paralysis is probably the best way to describe, you know, uh, what's offered to you in technical analysis. There are so many things and, and so many things that people are coming up with all the time that are just there their takes, their uh, angles, and I mean that in a good way, of course, uh, yeah. on something that might already exist or completely new analysis. And what I like about what you were thinking about when we were working together was, you know, let's simplify this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that on the, you know, to, to follow up on that is that without a strong checklist of technical tools, without a disciplined process, you're really then falling victim to your own emotional biases and the whole problem of, of human nature. So we do need that step-by-step -step process. We need to walk through uh, the weight of the evidence approach to make sure that our technical uh, indicators or whatever we're looking at are lining up and giving us that uh, strong sense of being, uh, putting the evidence in our favor or putting the, putting the, uh, the sort of the technical tools on our side. But, then that's when we lead to analysis paralysis. So, uh, you know, if you could, if you could go back to when you just discovered technical analysis, when you'd first heard about it, what is this? What is this? Right. It seems important. What do you remember the first, let's say indicator that really impressed you that really resonated that, you know, you had that aha moment that said, wow, this is really cool. I want to find out more about this. That's a, you know, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. That's a great question. But I think that for me, I, I've always been a visual learner. So, you know, the numbers, I, I used to do a presentation where I would put the a table of data on the screen and sort of say, okay, just look at the data. Can you see a trend in that time series of data? And unless you have a very a brain that works much faster than mine, you're not going to see that trend. But if you put that on a chart, you can see it moving from, let's say, bottom left to top right. You can see it right away. Um, and so for me, it was always the simple stuff. You know, even just the first moving average, understanding that 
if price is above a historical of average of its prices, that's inherently bullish because we're trading higher than we have been trading over a certain time frame. So I think for me, just, just the simple understanding of how you can with, extract the trend from visuals was what really captivated me. And I, I'm a big fan of data visualization and I did quite a bit of research in that area and, and just that it's, it's technical analysis, but it's also charting what's happening in the markets and, and being able to see the dynamics perhaps um, of supply and demand that are underneath the chart. And so the visual aspect for me uh, was always what drew me to it. Right, and, and the idea of numbers and tables of numbers, some people do like that. Some people are able to grasp that. I think most people are not inherently able to do what you just said. Look at this table of numbers and tell me what you see and tell yeah. me what, what's valuable. And yeah. you know that's what appealed to me about technical analysis and about data visualization is if you could take you know, just an immense amount of data and boil it down into a picture that's easily understood, you know, uh, understandable what the meaning is. That, that to me is worth its weight, you know, in gold. Yeah. The, you know, there's a, there's a term that I still think it still gets used, but it was definitely becoming popular and, and used a lot a couple of years back was that democrat democratization of, of data, right. Of, of um, big, big data and that, that ability to get the, insights from big data to the end user in a way that they could understand. And so that's data visualization. And then it goes, makes me think of my, my dad used to work for, um, uh, for British aerospace back in, you know, the sixties. And he would talk about the, you know, it's just amazing stories about, they used to call it the, the big machine in the room, you know, and they it would have to be kept dust free and, and they would plug in their calculations. He was an engineer and they'd plug in their calculations and it would sort of spit out a, like, a, you know, these cards, and all, that was sort of his first experience, and he would tell me all about how, how revolutionary that was, that you could send in these calculations and get something spit out on a card that was just so much easier to understand, and just to think about where we are now, it's it's just incredible, but, I, but, but at the same time, I think we're just scratching the surface of what we can do with data visualization. You know. Oh, oh, for sure. I, you know, it it still boggles my mind when I see pe people looking at spreadsheets just to simplify the concept, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, I have the experience with the baseball, and one thing, you know, teams weren't doing pitch progression analysis, and and that's something we could do. We had the information, and so our developers developed that, but they spit it out in a table worth of data. And I said, well, this we're halfway there. Right exactly. now, take that and let's make it visual. And I created a visual around it. And when we showed it to the one team that was doing that, they were just, this is great because they didn't have the visual part of it. So really, I think there's a couple of things, you know, what are you trying to analyze? And then how can you bring it out in the most efficient way? Because ultimately, all of this is about efficiency. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the end user that gets, that used to get the, uh, Sort of the wrong end of the stick. That that's where we can make some real progress. I think in our field is that we can, you know, if you hire the right people, they can make those. They can get take that table of data, and they can make those insights, and they can understand, and they can pass it along. But we can sort of give those insights to people uh, much much quicker, who who maybe wouldn't be like you said, the person that can see. Right? We're not all uh, we're not all people that can see the matrix and see the and see what's right. happening. You know, but but if 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 everybody else can get the outcome of that day or sort of the the end result of what that data is telling you, um, then that's really, really powerful. I mean, the, the application, I always, um, sorry, just a, just one more comment. I know I'm talking a lot, but I, I think we used to always talk about technical analysis as the original sort of data visualization of the financial markets. But I feel like we stop at the chart a lot, right? So we, we have that chart where we uh, we visualize the trend in data, but where can we apply that? And that's one of the exciting things that we're working on now with Go No Go Charts is taking this trend of uh, this this idea of understanding trend in a simple visual. But then, where else can how else can we display that data? Like we've been thinking about, you know, a maps of the world where we can color the the countries based on their country index with the color of Go No Go trend. So, oh, there's where all of the Go trends are. And and you know, maybe dynamic pie charts where you click through sectors to get to securities based on clicking through different colors. You know, we, we don't have to stop at the chart. You know, there's an application of technical analysis and you guys have some great 
great tools like that in NinjaTrader, but you know, heat maps, um, dynamic uh, pie charts, things like that. There's a whole world of, I think, unexplored technical uh, application of technical analysis. It's exciting. Right, and and you know, to that point, it's what what are you tr what question are you trying to answer will drive a lot of that, right? You know, like you said, we reside in the charts. It's more about trading. Where where should I trade? When should I trade? That's what the chart helps to answer. But you're talking more about well, which market should I should I trade, or you know, where might I expect some weakening, some strengthening in different markets based on this information, whether it's uh, uh, asset analysis or, or asset class rather, and or ge geographical, right, which can help you with the assets as well. As well. Absolutely. So, um, you know, maybe we can go to the charts, but let's go to, you know, I like the way you talked about a strategy mm. earlier, which was you still need to have a checklist of some sort. You still have a process when you're, when you're looking at the charts, there's a process. Do you think you could walk through what your process is or a process that you find resonates with uh, traders specifically? Yeah, I mean, would you like, I could just do it from a blank chart and, um, and show sure. you how, I, I'll add some indicators and show you how uh, how we see people using this stuff. Um, let me just make this a little smaller so that, yeah. So if, if I'm looking at a, a chart and I'm going to, let's say I, I take the go, no, go trend off there for now, but you're going to, uh, you're going to want to start with the basics. You're going to want to try to identify trend. That's what we're all looking for. We know that trend identification is the most important, really, part of technical analysis because if we can trade in the direction of the trend, um, we're stacking the the odds in our favor. So you might uh, you might look for a a system that identifies trend analysis. Now you might say, okay. We know that the ADX indicator, for those that know about it, that's an attempt to identify strength of trend. So we might add that to, to our chart. Uh, we might look for moving averages. Um, I, I remember when we were working together, Tom, we used to talk about the moving average almost not counting as technical analysis, right? When we're trying to identify power users because everybody has moving averages on their charts, even if they think, you know, yeah, I'm not a technician, right? But then you sort of notice they've got it a moving average on their chart, you know? So you might come in here and, and you might look for putting on a couple of moving averages that can give you a sense of trend. Um, you can you can look for crossovers. You can, you know, all of the basic foundational principles of technical analysis, you can start adding these to your chart to give you that sort of sense of where the trend is. Maybe you also then uh, want to put some kind of uh, understanding of what volume it is telling you. Right, you know, you might want to sort of uh, confirm volume uh, as when you're looking at price and you're saying, okay, is this move that I'm seeing in price particularly strong? Let me see if volume confirms. And so you can uh, you could put that on there. Charles Dow used to talk about volume as a con the first of the confirmatory tools that we have, right? And and if price is moving higher, you want to see market participation. That's how we sort of talk about uh, volume in go no go charts. It's about how many people are taking part in the move that you see in price? And is that important? Um, you know, we also like to look at, at breakouts and see if something's happening with uh, something like Bollinger Bands. You know, we, we look to see if price is moving outside of the Bollinger Bands. That's statistically significant. Um, we know that in a normally distributed data set, about 95% of the data should be between two standard deviations. So, of course, financial markets aren't normally distributed, but anytime price moves out of a Bollinger Band, that's going to be significant um, information for us to to pay attention to. And so you can continue to do this, you know. And then, of course, you might want to look at something like even um, the first maybe of a momentum tool, like maybe something like MACD that's got a sort of an element of both, because you've got um, that uh, difference between two exponential moving averages, and you can sort of then apply a signal to it to get crossovers to see, you know, what your what your um, your trend is or what your uh, MACD is a great indicator because it looks at the difference between a short and a long term moving average, and you can sort of get a sense of how prices are moving relative to their recent past. So you you know you can add um, indicator after indicator and, and start to get a sense by following your your process 
that maybe a trend is um, beginning, right? That's what we want to look for. We want to look for the beginnings of these trends. So if you look at, say, the, the right side of this chart, you know, you walk through your process and you say, okay, we've got the short moving average above the long. We've got price. It was struggling with the moving averages, but now it's significantly above them. Price is breaking out of its Bollinger Band. Um, John Bollinger teaches us that, you know, there's, in its sort of simplest form, two ways to read those bands. One, when the bands are really wide, we were going to look for mean reversion. But when the bands are narrow, that means it's been a bit of a squeeze in volatility, and we could trade the direction of the break. So I'm eyeballing this here because, of course, at this point, we're having to be a bit subjective. But this looks fairly narrow as we break to the top side of these Bollinger Bands. Um, and then we've got MACD just barely crossing above zero, which is a bullish it's bullish in itself because we know that that means short-term prices moving higher than long-term prices. Uh, ADX, yeah, that one might conflict a little bit below 25. Not that sort of says not trending, um, but you know, over here somewhere on the right, we could say, look, we're starting to see some signs, some constructive evidence of a trend in a new uh, a new uh, direction. But the problem, you know, maybe it's evident already, is that this is just, you know, that's sort of a simple process. Uh, most of the people we work with will have a much bigger process than that. And as you add, we haven't talked about volatility squeezes really in here. Uh, we put Bollinger on there, but there's ways to read that. You know, you might want to add momentum indicators. I mean, think about who doesn't have RSI on their chart or some form of stochastics uh, to get a sense of price velocity. Um, and so you can start adding more and more to this chart, and then you lose the uh, ability to just easily see what's happening in price in terms of levels. Um, and also, the more you put on there, you're going to get things that conflict. You're going to, maybe you're a victim then of um, using indicators that are trying to tell you the same thing. And and it comes down to how sort of disciplined you can be as a human being. Uh, a friend of ours, I, I uh, Josh Rosen, used to say that um, technical analysis is, you could, you could define it in any way you want. There's so many definitions out there, but he says it's just a study of human nature, right? And how, how people act. And, and so we are allowing ourselves to become subjective uh, the more we put on this chart. And, and that, that was sort of the problem that we're facing. And then that's when we said, let's try to put a really strong technical checklist into something that doesn't complicate our chart and makes it in fact easier to read. So, you know, that's a lot. And, and of course that's a lot, you know, a lot because there's a lot to choose from. Like you said, you know, the redundancy you want to avoid, but even just looking at your chart, these are complementary studies, right? You've got a volatility indicator, a volume indicator, you've got a momentum indicator, you've got a trend strength indicator. There's not much conflicting, right? And still we haven't we haven't even drawn trend lines, right? right. Yeah. Which are subjective. And and so already it's a very busy chart with just what I would say, you know a basic smattering of pretty common technical analysis tools from all sorts of different measure uh, um, areas. And, you know, it's your, your half the chart is, is the price action, which is really as a trader, you want to be, you know, keyed into. Yeah. And I, I, you're a hundred percent right. And, and that's sort of the way we, you know, if you try to build a process, you do want it to be complementary, like the, like you just said, but even then keeping it really minimalist, um, it's hard to to draw trend lines and it's hard to see that price activity. And and we, I, I really remember um, you you talked about what was one of the first indicators that got me uh, excited about technical analysis. Well, I remember the first book was the Edwards McGee book, and and that is still it still applies today. It's still so relevant. But that is price pattern analysis, and that's looking at at the chart and understanding supply and demand based on. Uh, highs and lows and support levels and and um, I I love technical patterns the traditional support lines resistance trend line analysis uh, because I I believe you know that's that's the area where I fight a lot as a technician because that's the area where people say you're just drawing lines on a chart and they that's the bit where people sort of say that's subjective it's a lot easier to tell to show people technical indicators because they're calculated and so they don't uh, assume there's any subjectivity there. When you're talking about pattern analysis, you get into that argument about subjectivity. But I would argue that technical patterns are just 
you're only able to see them based on the dynamics of supply and demand that are underneath the chart. If I'm able to draw a support line, it's because there have been buyers coming in at these same levels that have told us that this is where the price is relatively cheap. Um, and until that changes, that's going to act as support. So you can call these patterns whatever you want, whether it's you know head and shoulders or whatever it is, but they are representations of market activity. So I certainly want to be able to look for those kinds of things on the chart or even maybe putting other price analysis tools like Fibonacci retracements on the chart uh, is hard to do if you have a very small price panel and you, you can't see what's going on. Right, and we're a big fan of the Fibonacci uh, tools yeah. here at NinjaTrader. Um, you know, the, the one thing that patterns do is they're very hard to automate, right? They're very hard to say, this is a head and shoulders. It yeah. takes special, I, I think it takes special programming above and beyond indicators, but they yeah. tell a story and they tell a story of, like you said, supply and demand, where buyers and sellers find price happiness and where they might not. Um, but it's it's subjective because we're human, right? It doesn't, each pattern isn't a very hard coded, it has to be this ratio of this distance or, no, it's not. It's things evolve over time based on so many factors that affect the market. Something might be sped up, something might be drawn out. Patterns are going to be effective. We worked, as you know, uh, back in the day, we worked with a company that attempted to do that, attempted to program the ability to recognize patterns, and then they would spit out all the all the comp all the all the stock. You know, it was multi asset, right? Yeah. It wasn't just uh, the stock market. And and you'd look at these patterns and you'd say, well, you know, if I kind of squint and close one eye, yeah, that's a pattern because that's how difficult it is. You know, uh, head and shoulders, we like to think that the neckline is flat, but it isn't always because we're human. So, yeah, I mean, pattern recognition, technical, uh, and the, that part of technical analysis, that could be a whole nother uh, couple of shows for as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. And I think you're right. Like I've seen newer versions or newer attempts at pattern recognition software. And you still, you know, you say, oh, look at that. That's a, there's a cup and handle on, the so on so and so. And you open up the chart and you think, I don't see it. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Um, and I think that that is, but I also think that that is, sometimes that's that's the power of technicians too. There are some people that are very good at spotting market action, right? That's why people are in this business. And I think that, um, you know, the more you work with charts, the more you start to understand how that how that works. And you you'll start to see common formations that are telling the story, like you said, on a chart. And that is in, almost impossible to automate, but still valuable. So, you know, we find things, for example, using go -no go charts, that color change in the go -no go trend indicator will often happen on a break of an important level. So if we are in a downtrend and we've got a, you know, a downward sloping trend line going through all the highs, and then we see the go -no go chart break that trend line and a color change, then you're, you're adding more weight or more, um, you're putting the odds in your favor even more, and you're able to do that. Uh, because you've got a sort of a nice big price panel to work with. Um, but yeah. Price yeah. I, I, I don't oh. know if you ever got to work with uh, Carter Worth, but Carter Worth has his way of looking at the markets and it's definitely pr price pattern recognition. That's very s specific and it's very hard to program. I remember trying to help him program that with, with our, you know, with the software at, at hand at the time. And because of what he's trying to do, it couldn't it couldn't be done, right? Yeah. And so he had he his daily routine was to go through. I don't know how many charts it could have been in the thousands, yeah. right? Looking for this one pattern that would you know and he okay it matches. Let me take that. But I think he would even print these charts out, and and we're talking not just hundreds, maybe a couple thousand. Well, think about it if you're somebody that you know well and again that is the beauty of technical analysis i have some friends in sell side research i mean how many companies can you properly uh, track as an analyst in fundamental anal analysis right you i mean properly 20 or 30 you could really get to know their financial statements maybe you could really 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 dig deep and understand what's happening technical analysis you can uh, get a sense of what's happening uh, from a uh, from the market 
very quickly and cover a, a lot of charts. I mean, we knew people that would just go click through monitors of the Russell 3000. And, and you know, it's, it's time consuming and we're all trying to make things more efficient, but it's an amazing uh, area of study where you can get a sense of what's happening really quickly. And I mean, for you and I, when where we worked in the past, it was sort of the case of you might have to talk to an oil trader in the morning. You might have to talk to a long only mutual fund guy in the afternoon. You might have to talk to somebody who's who's looking at FX rates in the middle of the day. So as a technician, you can get a complete sense of the technical analysis on any asset, any time frame, um, using using a, a robust checklist of technical tools. And that really separates technical analysis apart. Agreed. Agreed. So let's let's take a look at the chart now. So we've got our chart. We've got our process. Yeah. We know what we're kind of looking for or, or what these in, these tools do. But, you know, at this at this point in time in your career, when you were thinking about this, you you, were, you mentioned, you know, clutter. Uh, how can I digest this in a simple way? And, and yeah. you know, this, the solution is go no go charts. That's what you came up with. Yeah. Um, be interested to see uh, wh what that looks like in NinjaTrader. Let me throw. Uh, let me so this is on. the same chart we're working in, the one that yeah. had all the indicators, and we're just going to swap out those studies. So we'll start with just the go no go trend, and so here's here is what it looks like on on the e minis, and this is what I was talking about here to the right side of that chart. If you remember, you started to see price above its moving average. You started to see breaking out of the Bollinger Bands. We were starting to to think that we may be seeing the beginnings of something in the upward direction. And when when we put all of, I mean, it's my, I guess, um, I don't want to say, see, people say secret sauce, but it's not really what it is. But it's my, my checklist over the years, working with colleagues, clients. What I think I want to look at from a technical perspective is telling me here that we've, the market environment has entered a go, right? So we've, we're seeing that bullish movements um, and, you know, that's all I need. I don't need the, all of the rest of it on the chart. That's what I would have got from analyzing a process. That's what I would be thinking. And so that's the, that's the trend identification piece of go, no go charts. That's sort of the core concept. Um, but we do, uh, and this is sort of, uh, this is the exciting part because it's all just about ready. So we have the complete go, no go suite of tools, uh, just about ready for, for Ninja Trader. And I have it working here in the demo, so I can add that as well. But what, what I found uh, when I needed to talk to somebody, Tom, was I need to give them a sense of trend. I need to give them a sense of momentum, volume, and volatility. And if I can talk through those four components, then I can be giving somebody the complete technical view on, on the chart that they're looking at. So let me go and add, um, and I wanted to do it again. It's, you know, you start to say, okay, I need this, all of this information I need this complete set of technical analysis, but I don't want to uh, cloud my chart. So what we do is we we put it just in one panel that I believe will give us um, all of the information that we need. So just okay, to Alex, quickly... before we go on, real quick, yeah, 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 because because we're talking to futures traders generally, yeah. and futures traders can go long or short, yeah. right, uh, pretty easily. Um, can you explain the go, no go piece? Because go, no go, uh, well, I'll let you explain it. Yeah, absolutely. I should have done that at the beginning. Thanks. So the go, no go comes from the NASA military speak in terms of, you know, is something a go or a no go for launch? And we wanted to get that sense out to, to investors and to, to traders that you need the technical environment to be right. Uh, you need to sort of put the put everything in your favor. So that's where the terminology comes from. Now, it is a uh, no go is our bearish trend recognition, right? And go is our bullish trend recognition. And we have multiple colors within each to try to uh, represent strength and weakness. So when we are in a, a stronger portion of the go trend, we'll see the brighter blue bars. A weaker portion will show aqua bars. And then, of course, these amber bars, these are our go fish bars. So we've got go, no go, and go fish because Jesse Livermore was was quoted as saying, there's a time to go long, time to go short, and a time to go fishing. If the market isn't giving you, you know, a sense of direction, 
you know, you, you don't have to do anything. So we often see these go fish bars in transition periods uh, between trend color change. But yes, if you are in a, uh, you know, and, and I, I could change, you could, we could pull up something that's in a downtrend, but if you look at even the, the, uh, the S and P on a weekly, we were in a no go trend for really for the past year, uh, making a series of lower lows and lower highs, which is really where you start and trying to identify a trend is, is looking for those highs and lows. Um, so that's the overview of the colors and yes, no go represents bearish territory. Go represents bullish territory, but then we wanted to then incorporate that complete picture by, uh, taking the same approach to our lower panel. So, um, I've worked with so many people that use, you know, I know that you want to be complementary, but at the same time, there are multiple momentum indicators that look for slightly different things. Uh, within that momentum space. So you might be comparing price to a previous price. You might be looking at a high price compared to the highs of a period. You might be looking at where, um, you know, if you've had a significant number of days that have closed up versus days that have closed down. Um, so those slightly different interpretations of momentum, I think there's value in in more than just one of those. So we took the same approach to the Gona Go Oscillator, and that was to blend those more uh, sort of well-used and tested robust momentum ideas into one indicator that gives me what I need from momentum. So we'll have, you know, shorter term inputs, longer term inputs to, you know, not to force RSIs in there, right? Like a normal traditional RSI with a 14 period, but then maybe we want to look at a more sensitive, faster moving RSI. And so we blend multiple inputs of momentum ideas into just one oscillator panel which will then allow us to get the sense of momentum we need. We can still look at areas like you can see here over on the chart, when we get an overbought level here, uh, that lines up with a high in price. When we get these oversold levels, that lines up with the, the lows in price. So you can look for those extremes of overbought and oversold. You can also look for divergence, of course, as we would with any good momentum oscillator. If you see price making higher highs, but uh, the oscillator making lower highs, that's bearish divergence. So you can get those traditional momentum uh, understanding from the oscillator, um, but we wanted to include also this volatility piece. Um, and, and what we want to really emphasize is that momentum tools were designed really for range bound markets, right? In the seventies when, you know, so we're looking for mean reversion, we're looking for when prices move really quickly in one direction, but we know that they can also be helpful when in trend. There's a lot of work done by people like Connie Brown, and we, we know that oscillators range when in trend. But the problem with trying to find those ranges and trying to understand those ranges is it, again, can become subjective. So if you're looking at something like RSI and it's ranging from around 40 to 80 in an uptrend, well, what counts as support? Is it 42, 38? If we drop to 37, does that count as a break of support? So um, all of that leads then into sort of doubting what you're looking at. And so with our oscillator, we wanted to calculate it in a way where we get an objective zero line when all of the inputs are in neutral territory. So if we are in a go trend, the zero line should act as support. If it doesn't, that's our early warning that the go trend is in trouble. And then when we're in a no-go trend, that zero line in theory should act as resistance because there should be no excessive buying in a, in a downtrend. When it doesn't, then that's a concern for the no-go trend. So that's our, that's our really unique uh, piece that's a little bit different. We have that objective level that could be used as support and resistance. And then to, just to sort of finalize, sort of sum it up, that grid you see is our volatility indicator because um, – we used to talk about it, Tom. I think you might have been you that told me this in the old days, but we used to talk about squeezing a tube of toothpaste that if the toothpaste eventually you squeeze it enough, the top will blow off. And that's that volatility. We're looking for those areas of reduced volatility, compressed volatility, because that can lead to a significant move. So when our oscillator rides the zero line, that means that momentum has been stuck at neutral, there's been a tug of war, very little directional momentum as it rides the zero line. And we allow the grid to build until it gets to a max. And then we watch it and we look to see in which direction it breaks. If it was this no-go trend at the end of the chart here was going to continue, we would have seen this uh, squeeze broken to the downside. That's what you'd expect. 
but when it gets broken into positive territory, uh, volatility squeeze broken into positive territory, that then leads the color change to amber go fish bars, which follows up with aqua bars. So um, we've now got that complete sense of what's happened technically, and and um, hopefully we don't need to add anything else to our chart. Uh, the only other thing that was in there, because we talked about it earlier, is a sense of volume. When this oscillator goes to dark blue, then we know volume is heavier than it has been on average. So there, there's now, for me, trend, momentum, volume, and volatility. And I can walk into a meeting with somebody, and, and we can talk about the technical analysis on a chart. And hopefully, it's something that they can understand as well. Oh, I, I like that. You know, the, the volume to me is often underplayed or even not even a consideration and see it here on the chart in a different way, right? I don't need those histogram bars and do that calculation. Is it increasing? Is it dis decreasing? Is it above its average? Is it below? You know, those are nice to have. I, I don't want to discount them. But again, adding that volume histogram on here would just clutter it up just a little bit. Translating it to color to me, you know, as long as you, as the viewer, understand what it is, right? Right. I don't know how much vo how much heavier volume is than than normal or than the the blue space, but that almost doesn't matter because I trust the algorithm. I trust to say, okay, this is heavier than normal, yeah. and then the light is lighter than normal. It's almost like it's above average, below average. And, you know, uh, okay, it's, great, it's moving on. The volume histogram on your chart, putting the moving average on there and seeing, you know, uh, but it's putting it into something that doesn't hopefully uh, take away from the visual. Right, so, so great. Now this is the E-mini S&P. We can all relate to that. Um, other markets, can we take a look at gold? Yeah. Gold had a big move today, and I, I also want to see if we can take a look at crude if we have time, but GC would be where we would start here. Let's see if it's loading. There we go. Yeah, you can see the big move today, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's up. Well, you can see it's up. Uh, what is that? 2%? It's 40, 40 handles. Um making new highs, right? New recent highs anyway. Um, but it, it doesn't really matter what the asset class is. No, not at all, all the time period. Um, now there's, there's um, this is a beautiful, uh, just as an example, this is an egg, you know, just to walk somebody through the life cycle of perhaps this the, the, the move here in gold, you see how in a no-go trend at the beginning of the chart, oscillator should stay below zero. It doesn't stay below zero. It breaks above on heavy volume because we've gone to dark blue. Then that amber go fish turns to go, uh, blue and aqua go colors. And then we look to see if that's supported by the zero line on the oscillator, which it is through that whole move as the go no go trend continues to paint blue and aqua bars. Now towards the, uh, when is this? In February, you see that move down was preceded by a break in the oscillator. That shouldn't have happened. We should have found support again here um, and then it entered the no-go and again now we're back above zero and in go bars but what i like about this um tom is that you can you can you know throw on some some trend lines some some whatever you you know because there's the price panel is what it is it's it's very it's very big and easy to see and you can see how on this uh on this most recent move you know we were clustering around these support levels that was from prior resistance. We were sort of struggling with it, but we were managing to stay sort of in touching distance of the support level, and now, now we've broken higher, right? So you can see that because it's it's right there on the chart and you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to find your price movements because there's nothing else uh, on top of it. Well, and I don't think you're gonna replace trend lines, right? The, you know, I don't think, it's very hard to make automatic trend lines, I think. Um, same you can thing do it recognition you know right. same, just lines everywhere because this you know you were as good as the programming at that point right and it's tough and, and right so nothing will replace trend lines and what you see with your eye i like that um let's do a quick look at crude before we wrap up because i, I do you know crude has been an interesting thing of course with the fundamentals fundamentals have changed crude has hit a new uh, a new level We'll see what it looks like. You know, we've gapped up in crude. So 
So just want to see how this uh, adapts to, you know, kind of anomalous pricing. Yeah, crude has been, um, you know, we do a lot of multi time frame analysis as well, of, of course, for clients. Um, so you want to keep this in the context of what's happening on a larger time frame, whether you're a five minute trader using the hour as your larger time frame or you're using the daily as your larger time frame. But certainly want to keep it in context. And in over, uh, if you look at this on the weekly chart, we are in a slow moving no go trend that's been in place for several months. Um, so we are we're looking at this most recent price action in that context. And we see that we are sort of butting up against resistance here. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what happens here if, if we can break free or if this is the top of that downward sloping weekly uh, sort of sort of no-go move. But a strong move off the zero line here um, that we can see, uh, meaning that we did get some real directional momentum, broke out of a small squeeze that happened just a couple of bars before that gap. So this is interesting because, you know, like, We've been just saying about the ability to, to draw trend lines. You you don't even really need to draw one here. The grid lines do it for you. You've got you've got this sort of horizontal uh, level here that that could well be some form of resistance. Love it, love it. Thanks, Alex. You know the time goes by always so fast. Uh, where yeah. can people find you if they want to learn more uh, about go no go charts and your indicators or con continue the conversation? Yeah, I mean, absolute pleasure, Tom, as always, to chat with you as well. But um, feel free, shoot us an email, info at gonogocharts.com, or just go to our website, gonogocharts.com. Um, we've got all of the information on there, as well as some, we've got a lot of educational uh, webinars, videos. So if there's somebody, this does pique the interest for somebody, you know, check that out. We've done um, so much uh, on the education page, which hopefully can really help. Uh, somebody interpret and understand what we're trying to do with Go No Go Charts. But yeah, you know, please. Uh, and, and just exciting that we will be soon available on uh, on NinjaTrader, as you can see. It's all working relatively swimmingly here. So it's good stuff. Yeah, no, it's great to see the progression. It's always great to talk to you, Alex. Look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks uh, yeah. in New York City. That'll be fun. Yeah, um, but um, in the meantime, everybody, thanks for coming and, and watching our, our uh, Traders Workshop show. Uh, Jim will be back in the afternoon. Bar is closing 3.15 p.m. Eastern Time. In the meantime, have a great trading day. We'll see you next week.